Hi everyone, my name is Lauren Zabrick and I am the Executive Director of the Cyber Project at the Harvard Kennedy Schools Buffer Center. First, I just want to thank Rice and Bort and the entire ICS Village for and team for inviting me here to discuss our paper entitled Toward a Collaborative Cyber Defense and Enhanced Threat Intelligence Structure. I want to start with a story just to paint the picture, you know, what how this is really informing my thinking. I spent over a decade in the United States intelligence community, and a big chunk of that where I was an analyst working counterterrorism. The group of analysts that I was a part of developed an entirely new methodology that at its core suggested that all data, no matter when it was collected or from what sensor it was collected, is important to identify malign activity from the benign. This mindset combined with leadership who removed bureaucratic burdens, such as arbitrary reporting requirements, let us be analysts and figure out the hard problems. And you know, isn't that what we all want as analysts? We want to be empowered to do that. Doing so allowed us to become very entrepreneurial in our work. We made relationships across the community, offering our cutting edge analysis for access to more data, and even creating our own forward deployed spots to make good on those relationships and to continue the mission. In this setting, I deployed overseas multiple times, sitting side by side with analysts and operators in joint operations centers or jocks, where everyone was free to share information with each other and where we all had awareness of the battle space because of the nightly operations and intelligence briefing. This is where I first became acquainted with this model that I describe in the paper, uh, which is best highlighted by Lieutenant General Stanley McChrystal's motto where he says it takes a network to defeat a network and that's the whole crux behind this paper um, so say what you will about our overall strategy in iraq and afghanistan from a tactical intelligence and organizational standpoint i think we were innovative and there's some really important organizational lessons learned here when i came to the cyber world in january of 2016 i was fresh from government and fresh from this whole environment and i watched organizations try to build up their own cyber capabilities, threat intelligence capabilities, operating on slim budgets and, and really trying to figure out how to defend themselves in, in during amid rising cyber threats, largely without government involvement. And I just remember thinking there has to be a better way. Now, I want to be very clear here. I know there was recent pushback over conflating cyber and CT. And, and while there are some distinct differences you know, and some um, areas of similarity, you know, it's, it's the intelligence and the organizational concepts that I'm really trying to carry forward here. I think our current threat environment demands the need for more collaboration, increased collaboration. We're witnessing increasing ransomware attacks and intrusions into our critical infrastructure by both state and non-state actors with increasingly sophisticated capabilities and sharpened intent. And so the strategic vision set forth by our president and his senior cyber leaders is truly critical to helping us become more secure and resilient. But to operationalize that vision, we have to ensure that the structures and the policies to facilitate that collaboration are in place. And um, as we know, they're, they've been lacking. So this is my idea to create those structures and policies, kind of like if you build it, they will come. Now from there, you obviously need strong relationships between people and, and even better ways to operationalize intelligence. And this paper doesn't exactly address that, but I will make a quick plug for Share the Mic and Cyber, which in October, we're gonna be really focusing on those human to human tactical relationships for public private partnerships. So is this a perfect answer? I don't know, but it's a conversation starter. And there's some new ideas in here, building on some existing ideas from other people. Um, so I'm really excited to talk to you about this today. So first I wanna go over how we did the research and what we know about the current state, and then I'll go into our five recommendations and wrap up and I'll wait your feedback. We conducted research and interviews starting back in November of 2019. And we wanted to talk to people across the entire ecosystem, we did. We spoke with people at state fusion centers, in national labs, 
people who were still in the federal government or who had just left, people from CISA, the Department of Energy, the intelligence community, the FBI. We talked to people at ISACs and ISAOs. We talked to people in various private sector companies, uh, especially threat intelligence analysts, both large and small, and, and some even in the critical infrastructure sectors. We wanted to map the current state and an earlier version of this paper has 20 pages dedicated to the subject, but we cut most of that out for length because we want people to actually read the paper. But our thesis was that our current environment across the domestic landscape is um, it's very stovepiped and uncoordinated. And as you know, it leaves the analysts and the operators overextended. You're all exhausted. Um, and it's not getting much better. And, and of course, our critical infrastructure remains vulnerable, which was born out of our research. Now, we know that for defense, there has to be a layered approach between uh, the diplomatic community, the military, the intelligence community, and of course, regulations. Um, and, and this paper doesn't address that. It's really just focused on um, the nature of our collaboration and, and threat intelligence sharing. Um, so take that for what it is. We looked at the landscape through four different lenses, cultural, organizational, legal, and technological. And it was part of my hypothesis from the outset that these were where some of those barriers were to effective collaboration. As we know, domestic cybersecurity is really hampered by limited resources, talent, data, funding, um, it, there's a siloed approach and, and even, uh, especially at the state and local levels, an emergency management law enforcement approach, um, which isn't necessarily a bad thing, but um, doesn't really lend itself to strategic whole of nation um, approaches to the problem. Um, the private sector is responsible for their own networks and their own data, as you know, with varying levels of maturity and resources. And similarly, the federal government suffers from swim lanes, budget limitations, paperwork requirements to, um, to actually work with the private sector, classification issues. There's a lot of um, trust issues between public and private. And you know this, this thought of, well, if I'm going to work with you, what am I going to get out of it? So a lot of um, entities thought they weren't really getting much out of that collaboration. Um, not one person has been able to really hammer this out between the interagency and you know engaging with the private sector um, on from a holistic standpoint and so to us the fundamental challenge is that the structures the policies and the incentives are lacking and the relationships that do exist are largely ad hoc and they're point to point there's no clear operational picture of the entire threat landscape or again, a coordinated, sustained, strategic approach um, to really address the, the issues. We really lack a comprehensive understanding because we aren't collecting, processing, and sharing that data that's out there in, uh, in a coordinated manner. So before I jump into our five recommendations, I want to read you a quote from Team of Teams by Stanley McChrystal, where he says, organizations must be networked not siloed, in order to succeed. Specifically, we restructured our force from the ground up on principles of extremely transparent information sharing and decentralized decision-making authority. We dubbed this goal the state of emergent, adaptive, organizational intelligence, shared consciousness, and it became the cornerstone of our transformation. That quote right there is really just the driving vision for um, the, the structures and, and the policies that I describe here. So um, restructuring, um, transparent information sharing, and you know, at the, at the different level, uh, decentralized lowest levels of making those decisions, but still having that, um, that common thread uh, across the whole landscape. So our first recommendation um, to actually create those structures is to take something that exists now and transform it. And what we're recommending is taking the current CISA regional office structure. So they have 10 regional offices right now and um, they are staffed by 
uh, from what we could derive a handful of people, they're more advisory posts right now. But what we are recommending is to take each of those offices and just build them out, create, making them bigger, outfitting them with um, all, you know, a, a number of workstations and um, uh, common communications across, across all these nodes. And we're calling them or we want to call them the Collaborative Defensive and Analysis Centers or CDACs. So mirroring the jock, sorry, the jock um, construct, but you know, we, we don't want it to be over militarized. But in this setting, analysts and operators would sit side by side analyzing, sharing cyber threat intelligence, um, providing early warning across the ecosystem, and coordinating defensive actions with stakeholder organizations. And mentioning the stakeholder organizations, people may think, well, who has a seat in the CDAC? Obviously, not everyone can have a seat in, in the organization. And of course, it is incumbent upon the different entities' um, staffing levels, whether they can send somebody or not. But at a minimum, we're thinking people like uh, representatives from the FBI, representatives from CISA, representatives from the state fusion centers, so the states that are operating in that region, um, the different ISACs and ISAOs, especially ones that have a heavy presence in the region, um, different private sectors, companies, both big and small, but especially ones um, in the crypto infrastructure sector. So bringing all these analysts together um, and also giving them the ability to have reach back capability to their own organizations for additional analytic support and um, any sort of uh, defensive um, actions. A lot of people have asked, well, why regional offices? We think that they're key to this vision because they offer that physical breadth for the mission and a field office touch point um, for uh, businesses and, op and states operating in that region. We think a structure like this would ensure a sustained government-led coordinated presence in all regions of the country, but to combat the threat on a local level, something that I've heard called um, reaching communities in highly distributed ways. Um, and having intrinsic understanding of the entities in that region, I think is really important because um, there, there's just different needs and different um, realities on the ground. And then of course, every day or night, uh, we think there should be an enterprise-wide operations and intelligence briefing that everyone in the CDAC could observe and gain situational awareness. Um, you know, the analysts would share strategic intelligence, operators could debrief the incidents, and you know, note any major reflections from those activities. And we think this would be the thread that holds all the different nodes in place and continues to build that connective tissue. Our second recommendation is to scale voluntary data collection and processing. You can't really have this structure without the data um, to, to go through and to really provide that foundation for enhanced analysis. So collecting more threat data and processing it, and by processing, I'm talking um, indexing, applying analytics, uh, minimizing it, so stripping out all of that personally identifiable, organizationally identifiable information um, to detect anomalies, to create that common operational picture, and then to ensure that it is shareable at, at both speed and scale. Um, we have the information out there, you know that it's, it's in, all these different networks, it's with companies, it's with government organizations, cloud service providers, ISPs, et cetera. Um, but we need to get this data, again, this anonymized data um, into the hands of analysts to really drive those operations. And you may be asking yourselves, well, don't we have systems like this in place with say CISA's automated indicator sharing system or DOE's CRISP? Um, yes, however, um, while they can be or they should be very foundational and and help to provide early warning across the, the system um, they're just not or at least ace isn't uh to a point where it can really do that yet so they both of those programs need to be upgraded as far as their technology and increased in scale so for instance in september of 2020 
the inspector general um, released a report that noted at least in 2018 only 219 private sector organizations were members of AIS and those who did participate found that the information that they were getting just really lacked usable context, which, as you know, is, is just not you know, as helpful as that could be. Um, the, the program itself was understaffed, which really limited outreach to the private sector and the whole, um, you know, where DHS is really seen as a regulatory agency. I think a lot of um, organizations are very reticent to participate that, in that. And so we need to change some of those policies and increase some of those incentives. So to get wide, wide scale voluntary participation, we think uh, a number of things should happen. So first, ensuring that anonymization or, or minimization, so again, stripping out that information that we don't need that is personally identifiable or, or organizationally identifiable, but stripping that out, making that automated, but, but even further than that, is to put that burden on the solution. So instead of having every single entity who participates to, to have that as their responsibility, it has to be on the solution. Um, and that's not only from a legal standpoint, but a technological standpoint too. Access controls based on authorities, um, applying analytics and indexing this data, again, to be instantly shareable. Um, and you know, maybe it's through a data lake or maybe it's through um, the notional joint collaborative environment that the Cyber Solarium Commission recommends either way. Um, but you know, to create these analytics on top of the data to help analysts um, to free them up to do the higher order analysis and to essentially triage. Um, and you know, a couple, I mentioned the legal aspects. So the cybersecurity information security our Infrastructure Security Act of 2015 you know, should be amended to help facilitate the sharing. So again, um, taking the minimization burden and putting it on the solution and, and really the government uh, to do that. Um, and then um, removing the limited liability clause that limits private sector protection. So essentially adding more protection to the private sector entities that participate on there. So it doesn't have to be just sharing with DHS, for instance. Um, so in, ensuring that the incentives are there, the business cases are there, but making it easy for people to say yes to do this. Um, so with that, I will turn to the next recommendation to create a culture shift. And again, I will read you another quote, um, I think from Team of Teams, it may be from, um, uh, my share of the task, but uh, McChrystal said that in the world of intelligence, information was power, leading people at each stage to ask themselves a set of questions. Should we pass this intelligence? If so, how much will we get in trouble for it? And those doubts cost us speed and often diluted the intelligence, making it less likely to lead to targets. We widely distributed, without preconditions, intelligence that we captured or analysis that we conducted. The actual information shared was important, but more valuable was the trust built up through voluntarily sharing with others. And that I think is so key um, because as we've seen, the, the trust really needs to be built up between the, the public and private sectors um, trust, as well as again, those, those structures and policies. So much like the task force in the early 2000s, I think that we need to make a major cultural shift in our domestic cybersecurity posture. A lot of interviewees told us that there's a, a big disconnect between the field and Washington, D.C. So um, they may ask questions to certain representatives and it would just take forever because they would have to you know, root those questions back to D.C. So really, we have to flip that mindset on its head, promote this expeditionary culture in which um, a lot you know, the major activities happen in the field and D.C. is the reach back office for the federal government. And in fact, Chris Krebs, the former as a director um, has said the future of CISA is in the field. So along that, that line, we think this could really um, you know, be a, an interesting solution. And then to incentivize people to, to buy into that, then we recommend tying 
the ability to go out into the field, if you will, um, to promotions, bonuses, and raises, for instance. Uh, and then we need to really create a culture in which sharing and collaboration is the norm and not the exception. And the way to do that is for the leadership to set the mission, the priorities, as well as the conditions and the infrastructures, technologies, et cetera, to do so, um, but also to build that connective tissue between the nodes and ensure that people are executing in line with those missions. To help do that, um, for example, we need to move from same metrics as uh, measures of effectiveness, uh, metrics and numbers, say reporting uh, reports created to analytic outcomes. So um, in my experience, organizations that mandate a certain number of reports, um, at that point, collaboration and information sharing then becomes not the goal, but an inhibitor to creating those reports. So where the leadership removes those burdens of production from analysts and instead focus on those hard analytical outcomes and subsequently operational successes, then your personnel become more entrepreneurial and innovative. And most vital to realizing this is personnel from leadership on down to the most junior levels. Everyone has to be welcomed. Diversity is key. Uh, focusing on those people, um, but ensuring that they're they're welcomed and they're supported, um, and really focusing on diversity in demographics, background, and experience. Our fourth recommendation is to unravel the interagency. Um, in our research, we discovered that the interagency cyber environment was really characterized by competing equities and priorities, and up until the creation of the National Cyber Director, not one person was really only are able to unravel that yarn to determine those priorities and who arbitrates among the interagency, um, uh, you know, the equities, the classification battles, and then as also as they are coordinating with the private sector. So with the creation of the new national cyber director role, it appears that um, the Deputy National Security Advisor for Cyber and Emerging Technologies under Ann Neuberger will handle Title 10 and Title 50 cyber issues, so more on the offensive side, and the NCD will be responsible for the rest of the interagency and engagement with the private sector, so on the defensive side, from a strategic standpoint, while in continuous coordination with each other. And this distinction is important. We recommend that um, the president really imbue the NCD with that authority to ensure that the director can determine those priorities and, and hammer out those conflicts. Because when Congress set this position, they really gave the president some, some wiggle room on, on how to actually shape this role. So we're really hoping that the president can really um, give that role the authorities that it needs on par with um, the, the counterpart at the NSC, so Andrew Berger. So where uh, Ann Neuberger and Chris Inglis set that strategy, the other agencies, and especially CISA, will operationalize it. Given the agency's importance and its relatively small budget and the recent politi politi I can't say it, politicization, <laughs> we echo the call for CISA's independence from DHS. We believe that it would give greater authority, bigger budget, more operational flexibility to an agency that desperately needs it right now. Um, we think it could provide greater flexibility in hiring practices as it looks to scale up and out. And informally, we've heard you know, some frustrations there. So we believe that it would also allow for reform of the sector risk management, sector risk management agency construct that I'll get into in a second. But with CISA as its own freestanding agency, we are recommending that it establish its own intelligence arm, becoming the newest member of the intelligence community. That way, the office can work with the different CDACs to inform the intelligence collection uh, requirements and priorities. Because at this point, there's no real institutional mechanism for um, to inform the, the collection framework despite a lot of those threats really focusing on the homeland. So on the SRMAs, we think first that PPD 21 should be revised to enhance collaboration and sharing across 
all sectors and entities. So transforming the focus from a sectoral approach to a cross-sectoral um, mission focus and collaborative one. And then second, if you could take those missions to collaborate and share information with the private sector that are currently on each of the SRMAs, so think DOE, think um, TSA for pipelines, for instance. Instead, I think you could transfer those missions to uh, CISA, but really operationalized at the CDAC. So again, at the CDAC level, then they would be the ones taking care of sharing that information and working with um, their constituents, basically, um, uh, in the private sector. Our final recommendation uh, really focuses on personnel. We often read about the gap between the number of open jobs in cybersecurity and the number of quote unquote qualified personnel. According to CyberSeq, there were over half a million open jobs in the US and we currently lack the personnel to fill them. The pipeline is always going to be an issue. Um, there are a lot of people who are looking to get into this career field. They're working towards this employment, but for a variety of reasons, they're, they're finding it very difficult to make that jump. And, and one of the biggest reasons, and, and there are a lot, and we won't go into them right now, but one of the biggest reasons is that a lot of jobs, even entry level jobs, want their candidates to have experience. So how can you get experience if you can't get in? And a lot of people are, you know, even if they're able to overcome those high costs of training and certification, um, to make that jump has, has been very prohibitive. And so to bridge that gap, we're proposing a service here in which a person interested in this field could say receive training and support for certification in exchange for at least a year of service at one or more of, of the CISA, uh, the regional CDACs, for instance, but really getting that critical boots on the ground experience. Now, this is not the military. You're not going to have to get up and do PT. You're not going to have to deploy overseas. It's just this is your, the, your national service um, in exchange for training certification. You're getting that experience. And then importantly, too, I think it would really help to, to fuel civic renewal, uh, which is something I think we desperately need right now. But uh, you know, to make this happen, um, the president actually signed a law, the American Rescue Plan, that included $1 billion for national service. And so we recommend that the White House establish this interagency service core um, between now DHS, but if CISA becomes its own regional um, uh, freestanding agency, then something like that, for instance, and, and you know, eventually maybe include other agencies as well. But um, in, in cooperation with the uh, national community service organizations to create those opportunities, to create those pathways in, because as we know, we desperately need people. And then on the other end of the spectrum, you know, to, to raise the level of analytic capability across all federal entities and to get people who are very interested in cyber, but who haven't really found those pathways over yet, um, to create those opportunities for analytic exchanges between the agencies, but especially between CISA, FBI, and NSA. And so we think that um, it would sort of raise the level of capability, it would provide vital experience and training, um, but also build that connective tissue and that trust across the different um, interagency elements. So thank you so much for hanging in with me. I know that was a lot to digest, um, but I'm, I'm really thrilled to be here and I really look forward to your questions and your comments. Um, so thank you very much.